Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and Friends of Baylor. Uh, you know, I always think we're going to run out of things to talk about, but we somehow never do. Uh, one of the important things that for us in the, in the United States to think about is that we need to be paying attention about what's going on in the rest of the world because we will all be at risk for as long as there's uh, hot spots of this virus in, in the rest of the world. The virus keeps mutating, and so this is really, really key. I think that's Lily at the door, so you want to let her in. Nobody locks Lily in the corner. <laughs> Nobody puts baby in the corner. Worldwide, the coronavirus is uh, out of control in certain areas. But the good news is there have been about two and a quarter billion doses administered of the vaccine administered worldwide. That's equal to about 30% of the global population. The problem is, of course, it's not evenly distributed. Rich countries or countries that can afford to pay for the vaccine are getting very intensely vaccinated and poor countries that can't afford it are not getting vaccinated at all. And that's the problem because we have all these hot spots around the world. The good news, I mentioned last week, uh, the United States is going to buy 500 million doses of the uh, Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine for distribution to uh, 100 low- and middle-income countries, and we think that the, U um, the European Union will do the same. Of course, that's only 3% of the world's population, so we got a long way to go to really take care of the rest of the world. South America continues to be the real hotspot. Uh, almost all of the top countries for new infections and hotspots are in, in South America. And of real concern is, you know, for a while Africa was lagging behind, but is, be is now beginning to uh, increase. So you can see all the hotspots in, in uh, South America, uh, in Namibia, in Botswana, in South Africa, a lot of new cases there. So my guess is over the next several months, we will see the rest of the continent begin to really take off. And this is what is interesting. Worldwide, the case number is coming down. But actually, if you look at where uh, this is happening, the viral, the new cases are really going up in South America. So that's responsible for most of the viral burden. And this little tiny bit down here is Africa, but it's also beginning to rise. And it's basically a continent of susceptible people. So. I expect that uh, Africa will continue to be really, really bad over the next several months. Now, the most, uh, the most intense uh, scrutiny is on Delta variant. That is the one that really emerged in India. Uh, according to the WHO, uh, it has now been detected in, in over 80 countries. Uh, the Delta variant is now 10% of the cases in the United States, up from 6% last week. And so my concern, of course, is that the Delta variant will probably, almost certainly, uh, take over as the main uh, uh, variant here in the U.S. Right now, the U.K. variant is by far the most dominant variant, but Delta is getting around. And in part because the Delta variant has been shown uh, in studies in the U.K. to be about 60 percent more transmissible than either uh, the Alpha variant or the original variant. So it's going to outcompete uh, for new cases. Uh, it's also a little bit concerning that more hospitalizations are occurring, and it's affecting younger and younger people. And so, you know, this is a real concern as we think about who's vulnerable here in this country. It's obviously the younger population. Uh, it, and some of the, the symptoms are actually a little bit different. Uh, in the UK, which has had the most experience with uh, re at least reporting on the Delta uh, variant, the number one sy symptom is actually headache. Uh, it's followed by a sore throat, runny nose, and fever. But the more traditional sort of COVID-related things, such as cough, loss of smell, th that's becoming uh, rarer and rarer, and it doesn't seem to be as, as, a part, as big a part of the symptomatology of the Delta variant. Now, the UK has a really interesting system. It's called REACT. It's the real-time assessment of community transmission. It's run by the Imperial College of London. And each month, they take 150,000 people and send samples home for them to do uh, nose and throat swabs. And so they're actually getting a really, really good sense of what's going on in real time. And what they are seeing is a resurgence of COVID infections again, mostly due to the Delta variant. Uh, and its prevalence is now twice what it was just a few weeks ago. They've calculated an R number. Remember the number that R naught is, is how many people get infected. If one person's infected, how many do they infect? And it's 50% higher than the UK variant, alpha variant, which itself was already almost twice uh, as infectious as the original Wuhan strain. Uh, and they are seeing more and more young kids uh, being infected and the trend for increasing hospitalizations with this variant. Now, the other country that's really uh, getting slaughtered by the Delta variant is Russia. 
So Russia has reported 125,000 cases uh, of deaths from COVID, but we all think based on excess mortality that that's probably uh, about half the true number. And this outbreak of Delta variant is mostly in Moscow, and the cases have tripled in the last couple of weeks. They've added 5,000 beds just to deal with the coronavirus patients. Uh, and as of last Friday, they had 9,000 positive tests, the highest number they've ever had. Uh, and, and now the Delta variant in, is about 97, I'm sorry, 90% prevalent. Uh, and so it's really, really impressive how quickly it's taken over. Now, What's fascinating to me is only 10% of the population of Russia has been vaccinated. And remember, they were the first to announce that they had vaccines available. Uh, so they were the first to have them, but, but no one's taken them. And so for comparison, you know, you know we're about 45 to 50% here in the U.S. And so if you do a survey of, of Russian attitudes about vaccination, 62% of Russians say they will not get the Russian-made vaccine, <laughs> even though it's available to it. And why? because they don't trust it. <laughs> you know, just funny, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, so the good news, of course, is um, that the vaccines are incredibly effective. So if you look at the vaccine efficacy against Alpha, the UK variant, and, and Delta, the India variant, uh, after the second dose of uh, either Moderna or Pfizer, it's 88 and 80% effective. I mean, so uh, and against hospitalizations, it's 92 to 94 percent effective. So these vaccines are working fine. The variants are getting worse and worse and making people sick, but the vaccines work tremendously well. Which again, why do people not, not want to get vaccinated? Uh, well, in the United States, we're doing really terrific. Uh, we have fewer than 15,000 cases a day. That's the lowest since you know since vaccines became widely available. Uh, we did have the unfortunate uh, event of passing over 600,000 total deaths, uh, and about uh, uh, 350 deaths are being reported each day, which is the fewest since March of 2020. And I, I want to make one really important point uh, now that vaccines are available. From now on, start, from now on, every single U.S. death is fully preventable. So I, I want that to sink in. Every single death that happens now is preventable with vaccines. So, you know, there's just no, uh, you know, if, if, if when we have people dying over the next several months because of COVID, it's, it's all preventable and it's our, it's our fault as a nation. We can't make people feel more comfortable. I mean, we're like the Soviet Union. We have people in Russia that are afraid of the vaccines. Well, we have people in the United States who feel the same way and it doesn't make any sense. But anyway, and, and as I mentioned, the, the pace of vaccination has slowed. Remember, at its peak, we were about 4 million a day, and now we're down to less than a million. So that's now good. And, and my, my biggest concern is, if you look, yeah, we're doing great, it's fallen. But the fact is that the, the COVID cases aren't dropping anymore. We're sort of stuck at this. If you look, expand what's happening. Over the last several weeks, we're staying about the same. And if you just look at what happened in the UK when the Delta variant happened, it was way down like ours, and then it sort of began to increase again in the susceptible population. And if you look at the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation, their predictions are based on this, we, we might begin to see this go up again. And so we still have to deal with the susceptible population, the people who are not vaccinated, and kids under the age of 12. So in the Texas Medical Center, mostly good news. The R number finally is beginning to go down. It's 0.75. We're down to 2.2% positivity. And I'm really excited about this. Only about 160 cases per day over the last several weeks. Now, that's still 160 cases per day. And until it's down to 40, you know, where it's a rare event, I still feel there's way too much virus to feel like we're back to normal. There's just, we're still, we're still admitting people to the hospital, 56 hospitalizations a day. And those people, they're COVID related. So until we get the number down and fewer hospitalizations, it's, uh, it's gonna still be a, you know, in our community and make it difficult to return completely to normal. Now, one of the uh, unfortunate side effects that has been reported recently, uh, particularly in young kids, uh, is a myocarditis, pericarditis from the mRNA vaccines. This pretty clearly is related to that, uh, to the vaccines, and it's more often associated with the second dose. The cases are almost always very, very mild. Similar reports have been reported from Israel. Uh, the link is not exactly clear. Most people think it's just a really brisk immune response. 
uh, and it's not really all that clear, but it's also very treatable. You can treat it, and so and, and most of these cases resolve spontaneously. This has happened in other vaccines. Smallpox and flu vaccines are also associated with occasional myocarditis. So it's not like it's an unusual, but it has happened. It's happened in, uh, uh, in a 250 clearly rep uh, reported cases. And so uh, uh, it is a real complication of the mRNA vaccines. But it's so rare, it, it's still, to me, not worth uh, worrying about. I mean, it's worth worrying about and knowing about it. But I, I do think it's important to get your children vaccinated. Now, you know, I usually like to re review a science paper each week, but there was a great paper in the New, York, in New Yorker magazine uh, from Heidi Larson, who's an anthropologist. And the reason I think this is fascinating, is it's a great article if you want to read it. But in 2016, now think about this, 2016, she developed a tabletop uh, exercise about pandemics. And she did this at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security. And they created a, f a fictional pandemic. <laughs> They guessed it'll, it'll be a coronavirus, let's say. And it, they, they guessed it would be in 2025, coming out of Southeast Asia, but diagnosed in Minnesota as someone was returning from missionary work. This is the, you know, the, the, the theoretical tabletop exercise. Because it became known as SPARS, which was the St. Paul Acute Respiratory Syndrome, St. Paul, Minnesota. And uh, because it was around a holiday when they returned, uh, it, they created a global pandemic because of holiday travel. Now, this is what, listen to this. Early response, as they predicted, would be tripped up by government agencies giving conflicting information, national and local leaders sending mixed messages, scientists struggling to explain shifting data. Sound familiar? And citizens were disoriented by fragmented media, social media pro provocateurs, malevolent actors using confusion to boost profits. The conclusion from this, that 20, 2016, the conclusion from this was that the major, a major outbreak will happen, but it'll probably do, be due to a lack of preventive technologies uh, and more likely because of emotional contagion, digitally enabled, and a lack of trust in public health measures and vaccines. Here we are. They predicted in 2016, that's what's going on. That's us. And so if you look at vaccine confidence, this is fascinating. Who, who does not believe? So who does not believe vaccines are safe or effective? This is the map. Number one country where they don't think that vaccines are safe and effective, France. <laughs> I mean, you can't make it up. Well, then there's Bosnia, Russia, of course, because they don't believe their own vaccines. <laughs> Japan, they don't believe in them either. And they've got the Olympics coming up. So that should be quite a joke. Uh, and of course, Mongolia has a giant outbreak. They're very suspicious. We're somewhere in the middle. We're not the best for vaccines, but we're not the worst. We're somewhere around Germany and the UK where we have, you know, some people uh, believe in them, some people don't. So as I finish today, though, I want to shout out for, for South Texas. Of all the places that are doing well, the dark means there are more vac vaccinations. Those, those are doing pretty darn well, and our friends in Dimmick County are doing pretty well. So I think it's probably because Lily went down there, but things are doing pretty well on the Rio Grande Valley. Uh, and, and I'm really impressed with the fact that I, people, I think, saw the, the, the potential harm, saw a lot of people were sick. They're getting vaccinated, so, you know, good, good for them. And then the last thing is I want to do a shout out to Beth Robertson, who sent Lily a birthday book of David Hockney's Docs and Drawings. She absolutely loved it. It was fantastic. So anyway, have a great weekend, and I will see you next week.